Welcome back. In this module, I'll show you how to build a Vivado project for MIPS FPGA. So the steps we're going to follow for creating a project for a MIPS FPGA are we're first going to create a new project in Vivado, and then we'll add the Verilog files from the MIPS FPGA distribution from the Getting Started Guide. And then we'll add a clock. We can simulate it to show it running the program that's already in the memories of MIPS FPGA, compile it, and then download the bitstream onto the FPGA board. So let's start by opening Vivado and creating a new project. Click on the Start button and find Vivado. Vivado opens with the welcome screen and we're going to click on File, New Project. In the Create a New Project window, click on Next and browse to we could, for example, put it in the MIPS FPGA Labs, Labs, Xilinx, Part 1 Intro, Lab 1, Vivado folder. So one thing to note is that a text description of this process is also given in that lab, in Lab 1. Let's call this Project 1 and click Next. We're going to select RTL Project, click Next, and now we're going to add sources. So we're going to click on add directories so we don't have to add all the individual files. We're going to browse to where we were, where we put that RTLUP, all those RTLUP folders. Click on boards, choose Nexus 4 DDR, control click on decor, system, and test bench. And click select. And now we're going to click next and we're not going to add any existing IP but we will add some constraints. So click on Next and Add Files. It probably already put you here, but just to know where you are, you're in that MIPS FPGA Labs, RTLUP, Boards, and Nexus 4 DDR subfolder. So this constraints file .xdc, Xilinx design constraints file, gives us the interface instructions for which pins we're going to map to the switches, which ones to the LEDs, and so forth basically dependent on how they are routed on the Nexus 4 DDR board. So click Next, and now we're going to choose the part. And so we can go back. So the target of our system is the Arctic 7, and we can just copy and paste that part number from the documentation, paste it into our search field, and then select that Arctic 7 device as our target FPGA. Click Next, click Finish to create this MIPS FPGA project. So you'll notice several windows here in our Vivado project. We have the Flow Navigator, which shows us different flow options. We'll explore some of those. The Project Manager, which shows the hierarchy of our system. So you'll notice MFP Nexus 4 DDR is highlighted. So that shows our top level module. If we click to expand that, you can see the submodules, MFP system, MFP underscore sys. And then we can see this clock, clock wizard, that has a question mark by it. So that means our clock has not been created yet. So let's go ahead and create our clock next. We're going to click on IP catalog over in the flow navigator window. It opens up the IP catalog here on the right. And we're going to select FPGA features and design clocking, and then clock wizard. This opens up a clock wizard that allows us to take the onboard 100 megahertz clock and create a 50 megahertz clock from it. So in clocking options, we can select either MMCM or PLL. It doesn't matter. You notice at the bottom here, the input clock information says that the primary clock is 100 megahertz, which is the frequency of the onboard clock. We're going to click on the Output Clocks tab, and we're going to make our output clock 50 megahertz. In this tab, we're also going to scroll down to the bottom and unselect the Reset and Locked boxes. We don't want a Reset or a Locked input. Then we can click OK to finish the process. In the Generate Output Products window, click on Generate. And now this, this clock unit will be created. Click on OK, 
in the Generate Output Products window again. And we can notice at the top right of our screen that it's generating this clock wizard, clock wizard zero. So now we're ready to create our entire MIPS FPGA system. We're going to go up to the top of the window and click on Generate Bitstream. It's going to prompt us and say there are no implementation results available. Is it okay to launch synthesis and implementation? Click yes. You can also click on don't show this dialog box again if you'd like. And we'll notice in the top right of our window again that it's running the synthesis of the design. While it's doing this, we can actually go ahead and do the simulation of our system as well. So if you'll remember, we've mapped some of our input output of the Nexus 4 DDR board to memory locations. So we have memory mapped I.O. The LEDs we've mapped to address hex BF8 all zeros, switches to hex BF8 all zeros and a 4, and the push buttons to hex BF8 all zeros and an 8. Remember that these virtual addresses correspond to physical addresses starting at hex 1F80 all zeros. But our programs will use the virtual address to indicate these I.O. addresses. So this example program that we've shown before has our, so here's our example program that we've shown before. It shows writing an incremented value to the LEDs. So it loads the value 1 into register 9, loads the value of the LEDs into register 8, load upper immediate hex BF80 into register 8, and then stores register 9, in this case 1, to the LEDs, increments register 9, and repeats. So it branches back to L1. We've placed this code starting at hex BFC0, all zeros. Remember, that's the first instruction address that will be fetched by the MIPS FPGA system upon reset. So if we look at our equivalent machine code, our add immediate unsigned $9.01 turns into machine code 2409, all zeros, and a 1. That machine code is placed at memory address hex BFC0, all zeros, so that it will be fetched as the first instruction upon reset. The following instructions are placed at the next addresses, hex BFC0, all zeros and a 4, 8, C, 1, 0, 1, 4, and so forth. One thing to note is that our memory system is built as byte-wide memories so that we can allow for subword accesses, subword reads, and subword writes. So, for example, the reset RAM, which holds the boot code starting at hex BFC0, all zeros, it consists of four memory modules, RAM B0, RAM B1, B2, and B3. Each of those is 8 bits wide. All together, each line consists of a single word or a 32-bit word of memory. These memories are initialized by this read mem h or read mem in a hex format defined by these text files, RAM B0.txt. For RAM B1, it's RAM B1.txt, and so forth. So if we look at RAM B3 to B0, for example, we can see that it includes these instructions. So RAM B3, the first instruction, so the instruction will be located at the lowest address, hex BFC, all zeros, is 24 in RAM B3, 09, that next byte, in B2, 00, B1, in RAM B1, and the final byte in RAM B0. So in order to get an entire instruction word, we read from one byte from each of those four memories. In this case, we only have instructions at the boot memory locations and none in the program RAM, but later we'll have instructions at both locations. So again, we come back to this code and we can see the machine code at reset. It will fetch the first instruction, that add immediate unsigned. Next, it will fetch the next instruction, the load upper immediate, then store word, and so forth sequentially. So let's go ahead and take a look at this in simulation. So we're going to go back to Vivado, and we'll notice that it's still synthesizing our design, which is good. And we'll scroll down in the hierarchy panel, and we'll look at the simulation sources folder. We'll expand that and see that there's a sim1, simulation1, and we can look at our modules. We notice they're the same modules that we had in our upper module, our design sources, that we're targeting to our FPGA. In this case, we want to open up the test bench. So we can go back to our MIPS FPGA Labs folder, open up the RTL UP folder that we copied from the Getting Started Guide, and notice that there's a test bench folder there as well. 
and we can open up that test bench and take a look at it if we would like to. So it basically instantiates our MIPS FPGA system, MFP underscore sys, and creates a clock to run the system. It also toggles reset, so it makes reset low for some time, and then asserts reset to allow the system to run. So we go back down to our simulation sources, and we want to make that test bench module our top level module so we can simulate that. So I'm going to select that test bench module, right click on it, and scroll down to set as top. That will set the test bench module as my top level module. And now if we scroll back down to our simulation sources again, we'll see that highlighted in bold. If we click on that, we can see the submodule system and you can expand that even further for the hierarchy of the MIPS FPGA system. Now we want to include that, those program files into our simulation so we can simulate that simple program that we just showed that increments the values and displays them on the LEDs. We're going to go into the flow navigator and click on add sources and then click on add or create simulation sources and click next. Now we're going to click on add files and we're going to browse to the mem files folder of the RTL UP directory. This folder gives us files that define the memory for different programs. Each of these is described in the MIPS FPGA Getting Started Guide. So for now we'll click on the increment LEDs folder and this is exactly that program that we just looked at. So you're welcome to browse that folder in you know, an explorer window and take a look at those files as well. You'll notice that nothing shows up so we need to go on to files of type down here and click on all files so it'll show these text files. Again we only have instructions located in the boot portion of memory in hex BFC all zeros and so we only have RAM B0 through B3 defined. RAM P0 to P3 that's in that program or user space we're not actually using that for this example. So I click on these and select OK. I don't want to copy the sources into the project, so I keep that unselected and then click on Finish. So now we'll notice if we scroll down in the Project Manager window under Simulation Sources, we'll notice this new folder called Text. If we click on that, you'll see RAM B0.txt through RAM B3. And if you want to click on those, it shows right under this Source File Properties, you can see where those are located. So now we're ready to simulate our system. We're going to go again to the Flow Navigator pane and we're going to click on Run Simulation, Run Behavioral Simulation. When the simulation opens, we'll notice that it shows these top level signals, the reset signal, the clock signal, these HB light signals, address, read data, write data, h write, and also another HB light signal called h size. These next ones, ej reset, these ones that are ej tag signals, for now we don't need those. So I'm going to go ahead and take those from our, our waveform window here in black. I'm going to select those, click and shift click, and I'm going to go ahead and delete those. This one doesn't use the switches or the push buttons. So I'm going to go ahead and delete those as well, and the UART receive, UART RX, will delete that as well. Those just deletes them from the view window, so we don't have to look at them to clutter up our window. So now we can see that we have the reset up at the top. I usually put my clock up to the top, so I'll move that, just click and drag that up to the top of that waveform window. And now we're going to take a look at our system here. So you'll notice down in the bottom window here we have a, a, a tickle console and you can see some feedback from the simulation. So now we look at the simulation and we can say okay let's run it for some amount of time. We can run it for that time and we go up here and we click on view the entire simulation. And then you can click on some place in our simulation and look at what happens. So we'll notice after reset goes high, so we 
initialize our system by making reset low, it's low asserted. After reset goes high, the processor begins fetching instructions at physical address 1FC all zeros. So the address on the HB light bus is the physical address 1FC all zeros. And as we talked about before, the address is given in one cycle and the value red is given in the following cycle. So the address is given by the processor, by the MIPS processor, on one cycle. In that next cycle, the memory, in this case the boot RAM, produces the value at that address, the first instruction, 2409, all zeros and a 1. We can follow the simulation through as it fetches the next instruction and the following instruction. You'll notice that they take more than one clock cycle. That's because the system caches have not been initialized. And so the system actually takes more than one clock cycle to complete each instruction. Later when we run some boot code and have the system initialized with the caches, then it will take just one clock cycle per instruction. You'll notice at the store word here, where we're writing a value to the LEDs, the first value we wrote was one. So we have our H write going high and giving the address of our, you can zoom in there a little bit using the zoom button here. So our address is 1F8 all zeros, that's the physical address of the LEDs. So we have the address on H address, H right going high, and one cycle later the value 1, and now we can see the LEDs going high to 1. As we repeat this, we can go over here, we see it incrementing to 2, 3, and so on. Okay, so you can explore that. If you want to add more signals on there, you can click onto the hierarchy. For example, top, you can pick out some signals in here if you wanted to look at them and drag them onto the system or sys. If you wanted to add, drag some signals onto our waveform and, and see what they do, you could do that as well. So, for example, I could drag that signal over. If you want to delete it, click on it and select delete. And we'll notice that while we were doing our simulation, we could see that our bitstream generation was successful. And we can simply click on, we can just close this window and put um, cancel. We don't want to open the implemented design at this time. OK, so now we're going to close this simulation. And we're going to do the last step, which is download the bit file to our Nexus 4 DDR board. So I'm going to go ahead and discard the simulation. So now we're going to plug our Nexus 4 DDR board back into our computer and, importantly, turn it on. We're going to go down into the Flow Navigator and click on Open Hardware Manager, or you could click on Flow, Open Hardware Manager, either way. Open Target, Auto Connect, it finds our Arctic 7 FPGA on the Nexus 4 DDR board. Program device, select our Arctic 7 FPGA. It auto-populates with our bit file that we just generated. We'll see our project one that we just created, project runs, implementation one, and there's our bit file that we just created. Click on program. And now we have our MIPS FPGA system that we created from our Bovado project on the Nexus 4 DDR board. We press our CPU reset button to reset the system, and it begins fetching instructions at BFC0, all zeros. Again, we can see our LEDs program running on our Nexus 4 DDR board. And that's it. We just completed our first MIPS FPGA project in Vivado.